The subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the committee at any time. We welcome everyone to our hearing on oversight of bankruptcy law and legislative proposals. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. The overriding principle of the bankruptcy system is to give people who are overwhelmed with unimaginable debt a fresh start through meaningful relief from their debt. This system is supposed to work for everyone, from consumer debtors and small business owners <laughs> to family farmers, service members, and veterans, and give them a new pathway to economic prosperity. But as the witnesses at today's hearing will document, the bankruptcy system is not working. For example, as my colleague and friend Senator Durbin will attest, far too many student loan borrowers have been unable to succeed financially due to overwhelming student loan debt. The amount of outstanding student loan debt has skyrocketed to $1.5 billion. According to the Federal Reserve, this amount has tripled since 2006 and is expected to grow to $2 billion by 2022. In addition to undermining the quality of life and the earning of borrowers, the crisis has also severely affected the economy overall. The American Bankruptcy Institute reports that student loan debt has undermined home ownership, automobile ownership, and has also resulted in a decline in students choosing public service careers over the private sector. As this report notes, and I quote, student loan debt thus affects not only those who owe the loans, but also has consequences that ripple through our communities and our nation, end quote. Worse still, 20 states have passed laws to suspend or revoke occupational and driver's licenses for people in default for student loan debt. According to a 2017 report by the New York Times, there have been at least 8,700 cases of an at-risk or revoked professional licenses for student loan default. In one example, the Tennessee Board of Nursing, a state with nursing shortages, suspended the license of a nurse who defaulted on her student loan because she was unable to work for a period due to severe epileptic seizures. In order to reinstate her license, the state required her to pay more than $1,500, which she could not afford without a job, effectively ending her career as a nurse. This grotesque outcome is due to amendments to the bankruptcy code that have made educational debt virtually non-dischargeable. Under current law, student borrowers cannot discharge this debt unless they demonstrate that they would face an undue hardship if the debt is not discharged. While Congress intended that provision to provide relief for hard-hit borrowers, in practice it is an extremely high bar to relief for those with crushing debt. As an original co-sponsor of H.R. 2648, the Student Borrower Bankruptcy Relief Act of 2019, legislation introduced by Chairman Nadler and Senator Durbin to repeal the undue hardship requirement, I look forward to hearing testimony from our witnesses on ending this crisis. Today's hearing is also an opportunity to examine other potential improvements to the bankruptcy system. These include several common sense bills that would ease burdens, streamline the bankruptcy process, or expand eligibility for service members, veterans, small business, and family farmers. Additionally, this hearing is also an opportunity to consider heightened disclosure requirements for bankruptcy professionals retained by the board, established by Congress to oversee the budget and fiscal plans of Puerto Rico's instrumentalities. I welcome each of our esteemed colleagues to offer testimony in support of these thoughtful measures. And at this time, I now recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, the ranking member of this subcommittee, Mr. Sensenbrenner, for his opening statement. I thank the chairman. The bankruptcy system is an essential element of the U.S. economy. Rooted in the bankruptcy clause of the Constitution, it has since the founding of our republic provided the United States with the most stable lending environment in the world. I am pleased that with today's hearing, we can begin our examination of ways that we can make our bankruptcy system even better. The subcommittee is considering a wide range of legislative proposals today. I am an original co-sponsor of one of them, the Family Farmer Relief Act of 2019. This bill would raise the level of debt that may be taken into a family farm bankruptcy under Chapter 12. It is important that we consider this bill as it modernizes Chapter 12 to account for the higher levels of investment needed to farm in today's family farming setting. We will also examine the Small Business Reorganization Act. This bill offers a way to make Chapter 11 bankruptcy more accessible to small businesses. That will make it easier for small businesses to reorganize their debts rather than liquidate when they fall on hard times. Modeled on the Chapter 12 small farm bankruptcy provisions that have proven successful, the Small Business Reorganization Act holds genuine promise to help the bankruptcy code better serve American businesses in the 21st century. Two other bills we will consider offer more flexibility in bankruptcy for service members and their family. And the third would require more transparency from firms helping to resolve Puerto Rico's insolvency under the 26th PROMESA legislation. 
I am glad we are considering these bills as well. Finally, we will take a look at Chairman Nadler's proposed legislation to make all student loans dischargeable in bankruptcy. The amount of student debt has reached crisis level proportions for large numbers of the young Americans who are the future of our country. I am willing to consider bankruptcy reform should allow them an easier chance to deal with substantial debt. But I must emphasize that since the great majority of new student loans are federal loans, we must do everything we can to make sure that innocent taxpayers are not forced to pick up the tab for unpaid student loans. Further, Congress would be remiss if steering college students to bankruptcy court were the only help that we were willing to give. Regardless of this bill, we must address the skyrocketing cost of higher education. It is my hope my colleagues are willing to work across the aisle to achieve this goal. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner. Member the Chair now recognizes the Chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the Chair for holding today's hearing, the first hearing in the 116th Congress on the very important subject of bankruptcy reform. The Bankruptcy Code, either directly or indirectly, affects millions of Americans and all types of businesses, from the largest to the smallest. When it works properly, it offers a second chance to individuals and businesses in financial distress. But various reforms are necessary to ensure that it reaches its full potential. We are fortunate today to be joined by four members who have introduced legislation to address certain deficiencies and unfairness in the Code. I am pleased that this undertaking is largely bipartisan which I hope will help facilitate enactment of these needed reforms. I am especially appreciative that Senator Durbin is here today to share his thoughts on legislation that both he and I introduced earlier this year, the Student Borrower Bankruptcy Relief Act. Our legislation would address head-on the manifest unfairness that student loans, unlike every other unsecured debt such as credit cards or auto loans, are effectively non-dischargeable in bankruptcy. This subcommittee last considered such relief more than 10 years ago. Unfortunately, the problem of crushing student loans has only worsened. Currently, 45 million Americans owe student loan debt, estimated at a total of $1.5 trillion, an amount that exceeds, that exceeds outstanding credit card and auto loan debt combined. Some of this debt is attributable to for-profit education mills that promise much but deliver little. Some of this debt is also the result of predatory lending practices that target young Americans des desperate to improve their lives and contribute to society, but who do not fully understand the terms of the loans they take on. And some of this debt is disparately borne by minorities who on average owe more than their white counterparts and who are more often the targets of such predatory lending practices. There is no reason that this one category of debt should be singled out for special treatment that makes relief under the bankruptcy code virtually impossible. I thank Senator Durbin for joining me in attempting to put an end to this injustice. But the problem of student loan debt is just one of the many issues we must address. As today's witnesses will explain, we also need to address two important provisions affecting those who serve our country in the military. According to a 2018 lifestyle survey of service members and veterans, financial issues were the top lifestyle stressor, and unfortunately, bankruptcy is sometimes the best answer for those in financial distress. Under current law, National Guard members and reservists who serve in active duty are, like other active service members, exempt from the pa Bankruptcy Code's means test, which determines whether a debtor's income is too high to have all of his or her debts erased in bankruptcy. But this critical protection for National Guard members and reservists must be extended before it expires at the end of the year. In addition, although Social Security benefits are not treated as income for purposes of the means test, Veterans' disability benefits do constitute income under this test. Fortunately, bipartisan legislation addressing this inequity has been introduced in both the House and the Senate. We must also ensure that family farmers in financial distress are eligible for Chapter 12 of the Bankruptcy Code, the specialized farm, form of bankruptcy relief specifically intended for family farmers. I am pleased that the gentleman from New York, Mr. Delgado, is here today to discuss his bipartisan legislation that will accomplish this vital goal. In addition to these concerns, further reforms are necessary to better effectuate the financial reorganization of small business debtors. Experience since the enactment of the 2005 amendments to the Bankruptcy Code shows that provisions intended to streamline the bankruptcy process for these debtors failed to address certain fundamental concerns, 
such as the ability to cram down dissenting creditors who object to a debtors reorganization plan. I thank the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Klein, for his leadership on this issue. And finally, Congress should consider the need to promote greater transparency and integrity with respect to the ongoing financial reorganization of Puerto Rico. In response to dire fiscal issues facing Puerto Rico at the time, Congress passed the Puerto Rico Oversight, Management, and Economic Stability Act, or PROMESA, in 2016. That legislation established the Financial Oversight and Management Board with control over Puerto Rico's budget, laws, financial plans, and regulations, and the authority to retain professionals to assist the board in executing its responsibilities. Although largely patterned on Chapter 11 of the Bankruptcy Code, PROMESA did not incorporate all facets of Chapter 11 and other relevant provisions of the Code, including, for example, the Code's mandatory disclosure requirements regarding actual or potential conflicts of interest that professional persons seeking to be retained in a bankruptcy case must make to the Court prior to their retention. Fortunately, our colleague from New York, Ms. Velasquez, is with us today to discuss her legislation that addresses this shortcoming in PROMESA. In addition to our colleagues who will be testifying, we have a distinguished panel of other witnesses who will share their perspectives on the important issues under consideration today. Accordingly, I look forward to hearing from all of today's witnesses, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman now pleased to recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Collins, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Cicilline and Ranking Member Sensenbrenner. I'm glad that we're having this hearing today, and it's, it's good to be on something that we can all discuss and hopefully move forward on. It's good to see the senators and the rest of my members uh, here as well. The bankruptcy system is a critical component of the economy. It provides for an important safety net for entrepreneurs and households when they need a fresh start. It also stabilizes and encourages lending because it is a tried and true way for creditors to recover as much as feasible when things go wrong for borrowers. I particularly applaud this uh, subcommittee for considering today the Small Business Reorganization Act. This important bill recently introduced by Representative Klein and Subcommittee Chairman Cicilline offers long-term and long-needed reform to the Chapter 11 of the Bankruptcy Code to help small businesses. Chapter 11 has for many years been the key to survival for firms that need to reorganize their debt so they can continue in business. Reorganization preserves jobs, investments, and valuable contributions to our economy. But for just as many years, Chapter 11's terms have been poorly suited to allow small businesses and their creditors to take full advantage of the relief it promises. To solve this problem, this bill takes up as a model for small business the provisions of Chapter 12 that help small family farmers to reorganize their uh, family farming enterprises when needed. Chapter 12 has long worked well for family farmers, weaving terms modeled into, on it into Chapter 11 for general use in small business cases is a terrific idea. I was proud to have introduced the Small Business Reorganization Action last term uh, with the subcommittee chairman, Cicilline, and I'm proud to be an original co-sponsor this term. This bill promises to, make, to finally make Chapter 11 work for the entrepreneurs whose small businesses form the backbone of job creation in communities across our nation. We also consider today several other bills. Respectively, they offer more flexibility in bankruptcy for service members and their families, an increase in the amount of debt that can be reorganized in Chapter 12 bankruptcies, and an increased transparency concerning firms helping to resolve Puerto Rico's insolvency under the 114th Congress's PROMESA legislation. I am glad that we have the chance to examine these bills today. We are also, though, here to consider Chairman Nadler's proposed legislation to expand uh, the amount of student loan debts that can be discharged in bankruptcy and also recognize the Senator's work on that as well. However, like many members, I'm deeply touched by the skyrocketing cost of higher education and the massive amounts of debt students are taking on to shoulder these costs. To the best help, Congress must find ways to stop the explosion of cost. Congress has answered to students should not be, sorry, we're unwilling to drive down costs, but we're willing to, we want to make it easier for you to end up in bankruptcy court. The answer needs to be about the costs themselves and the institutions with a firm look at the total picture. And as someone who just came from the, you know, a few years ago on the state level, this is one of the biggest issues we have, and I'm glad we're discussing it. We need to find an answer to this, but I think we cannot also discharge the cost aspect of universities and systems that we go forward. Also, since the vast majority of student loans are now federal loans, our answer to taxpayers shouldn't be that in response to unbearable student loan levels, all Congress can do is increase the ways in which taxpayers get left holding the bag. That is exactly what happens when federal student loans are discharged in bankruptcy cases. I really want to help uh, the chairman's proposal and the senator as well, and would ask all my colleagues to join in real search and real solutions that we can find a total picture of this uh, problem that we have. It is something that needs to be fixed, but simply life, sometimes the best answer is not free. It is how do we get in and dig and find our important answer. With that, I yield back. 
I thank the gentleman. Uh, we have two panels of witnesses today. It's my, now my pleasure to introduce today's first panel. Our first witness is Senator Dick Durbin. Senator Durbin is the 47th United States Senator from the state of Illinois and is the state's senior senator. He serves as the Senate Democratic Whip. Currently, he sits on the Senate Judiciary, Appropriations, Agriculture, and Rules Committees. Senator Durbin is the author of S1414, the Student Borrower Bankruptcy Relief Act of 2019, which is identical to H.R. 2648, a bill introduced by Chairman Nadler earlier this year. Our second witness, Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez, is the representative for New York's 7th Congressional District. In the 116th Congress, she is the chair of the House Small Business Committee, a senior member of the Financial Services Committee, and a member of the House Committee on Natural Resources. She is currently serving her 14th term as a member of Congress. She is also the author of H.R. 683, which would impose disclosure requirements for professional persons employed by the Financial Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico. Our third witness on the panel is Representative Ben Klein of Virginia's 6th Congressional District. He is a member of both the House Judiciary Committee and the Education and Labor Committee. He previously served as a member of the Virginia House of Delegates from 2002 to 2018. Representative Klein is author of H.R. 3311, the Small Business Reorganization Act of 2019. Our fourth witness on the first panel is Congressman Antonio Delgado, the first term representative from New York's 19th District. He's a member of the Agriculture, Small Business, and Transportation and Infrastructure Committees. Additionally, he's the author of H.R. 2336, the Family Farmer Relief Act of 2019. We welcome all of our distinguished witnesses on our first panel and thank them for participating in today's hearing. Please note that each of your written statements will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. As you know, to help you stay within this time, there's a timing light on your table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals your five minutes have expired. We'll, of course, try to afford you every courtesy we can. We'll begin, of course, with Senator Durbin. You may begin. Chairman Cicilline, thank you for the introduction. Chairman Nadler, good to see you again. My friend, uh, Congressman Sensenbrenner, it's great to be here with you, and Congressman Collins, who left earlier. We've worked together. Uh, I'm going to submit my statement for the record, and I'd like to just make three or four points, if I can. Number one, I recently had a conversation with a member of the Federal Reserve, I won't name the person, and I asked about the issue of student loans, and this person said to me, this noted economist said to me, I don't get it. Why is it, no matter what you borrow money for, whether it's essential or frivolous, under our bankruptcy system, you can be discharged from that decision to borrow that money under certain economic circumstances, but not student loans. Student loans trail you to the grave. This is a decision you're making that's gonna be with you to the bitter end because you can't discharge it in bankruptcy. And think of the people most affected by it. They are the people in America least experienced when it comes to debt. 19, 20 year old college students, what does $30,000 mean to that student? What does 50,000 mean to that student? Probably nothing, because they don't have a life experience to measure it against as to what they're likely to earn and what they're likely to be able to pay back. And that's the class, the largest class of people who are affected by this decision, which says we will not allow you to discharge your decision, even if it's a bad one, in bankruptcy, except in the most extreme circumstances. I also like to make a point that the Wall Street Journal took a look at how many people qualified to be discharged in bankruptcy for student debt because of undue hardship. The Wall Street Journal found in the year 2017, despite the fact, as Chairman Nadler said, we have tens of millions of people in debt with student loans, four, exactly four in the entire United States of America could prove undue hardship. You know, the Department of Education enforces the collection of most of these student loans. I've asked them to consider the possibility that if you are a quadriplegic disabled veteran saying it's an undue hardship to pay back your student loan, you just might be credible. Well, I haven't been able to convince them of that, but it shows you the extreme circumstances we have here. The only debt you cannot discharge in bankruptcy incurred by people with little life experience and virtually no way to escape it by the current law and requiring undue hardship to be proven. The other point I want to make to you is a point well taken. We need to address not only student debt but the increasing cost of education. It's gone through the roof. It's out of control. First stop, let me suggest to you, I'll give you two numbers. And these two numbers are going to be on the final, so you might want to write them down. Nine and 35. Nine percent of high school graduates in America go to for-profit colleges and universities. 
35% of all student loan defaults are students from for-profit colleges and universities. What does it tell us? They're overcharging and undereducating. They're not preparing the people with this debt to move forward in a life that can pay off that debt. So 35% of all the student loan defaults can be addressed by addressing the outrages involved in the for-profit college and university industry. Secondly, I happen to believe that when it gets right down to it, that there's going to be a restructuring within higher education. Uh, Jack Reed, well known to the chairman, has a provision which says to a school, you're going to have skin in the game. You drag this student into a debt that is unimaginable, unpayable, your institution's going to be on the line too. Why is that such an outrageous idea? They're borrowing money through the federal government, and in some cases, in the for-profit cases, running all the way to the bank. Why shouldn't they have something, some skin in the game when it comes to defaults on student loans? They might think twice about the loan. They might think twice about the cost of tuition and higher education. We've got to get them in sync with the reality that unless we do something, they've got a perfect world. They can use federal taxpayers' dollars, make the profit off of them, and leave the responsibility to those kids, their families, and future generations. Let's start with this. Let's do this change in bankruptcy. It wasn't that long ago that people could discharge loans in bankruptcy. Let's return to that. I think it'll give not only these young people a second chance, but it'll be a dramatic boost to the economy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator German. The chair now recognizes this Representative Velasquez for five minutes. Uh, Chairman Cicilline, uh, Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Simpson Brenner, and members of this subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on my legislation the Puerto Rico Recovery Accuracy in Disclosures Act. This important bill will close a loophole in the island's debt restructuring process, improve transparency, and restore confidence and integrity in the process. Before Hurricane Maria devastated Puerto Rico in, in late 2017, the island was already in deep recession brought on in part by trying to pay down over $120 billion in government debt. In response, Congress passed the Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, known as PROMESA, in 2016 to set up an orderly bankruptcy process to restructure this debt, stimulate economic development, and put the island on a path to financial uh, recovery. While we can have a difference of opinion on how well the Oversight Board is carrying out its mission, one thing should be clear. The island and her people are entitled to the same rights and protections as any debtor debtor on the island, uh, on the mainland. As the committee is aware, the trust the American people have placed in our bankruptcy system is based on a fair, efficient, and transparent process. Transparency as required by Section 327 of the Code and Rule 2014 applies to every corporate bankruptcy and ensures any conflicts of interest or even the perception of a conflict between those working on the bankruptcy and the debtor are disclosed. However, PROMESA does not have a similar requirement. My bill will address this oversight and apply a robust disclosure requirement to all PROMESA Title III proceedings, eliminating the double standard that the people of Puerto Rico are facing. Puerto Ricans should be confident that the board's bankruptcy advisors do not have their thumb on the scale to favor certain debts where they have a self-interest and ensure integrity in the PROMESA process. The need for Prada was recently articulated when a board-appointed law firm investigated potential conflicts in Puerto Rico's bankruptcy. One of the main recommendations in the Luskin report was that vendors should disclose affiliate relationships and found that trading in Puerto Rico public debt is particularly problematic as it gives rise to the appearance of conflict. This is exactly what the Prada bill requires vendors to do and why the bill should become law. Prada will guarantee to the people of Puerto Rico the same transparency 
and disclosure practices required by law in U.S. mainland bankruptcies. In the interest of fairness for Puerto Rico's people and for the impartiality in restructuring and thereby securing Puerto Rico's future, we must pass H.R. 683 and close this loophole. I'm proud to say this, this is a bipartisan legislation with co-sponsor from both sides of the aisle, including members of this committee and members of the Natural Resources Committee, which, as you may know, has been deeply involved in Puerto Rico policy. I kindly ask that the Judiciary Committee look favorably on this bill, and I thank you again for the opportunity to be here today and to bring fairness to the people of Puerto Rico. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Velasquez. The chair now recognizes Representative Klein for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and Chairman Nadler uh, for holding this hearing today and for the opportunity to appear before you to discuss the Small Business Reorganization Act, which I'm proud to introduce alongside the chairman and Ranking Member Collins. In 2010, the National Bankruptcy Conference Small Business Working Group identified a problem regarding small businesses in the current bankruptcy law presented to Congress a report which recommended amendments to the Bankruptcy Code to add a new chapter for small business reorganizations. Chapter 11 of the Bankruptcy Code was primarily designed to allow a business to restructure its debt obligations while maintaining operations, with the underlying principle being that a business in its entirety is more valuable than assets valued independently. The point of Chapter 11 is that preservation of the business benefits both the creditor, who should receive a higher recovery because of the debtor's restructuring, than they would otherwise obtain through a liquidator and the debtor who can remain in business. Unfortunately, the current bankruptcy code makes it difficult for small businesses to reorganize and forces them to use alternatives that often lead to liquidation. When the choice is between a process that is time consuming and needlessly expensive or the simpler route of negotiating with creditors or liquidation under state law, many small businesses overwhelmed by their situation choose the latter. Our legislation in tends to fix this problem by allowing small businesses with less than $2.5 million in debt to file bankruptcy in a timely and cost-effective manner and hopefully allows them to remain in business. This not only benefits the owners, but employees, suppliers, customers, and others who rely on that business. Under our legislation, small business owners could retain a stake in the company if the reorganization plan doesn't discriminate unfairly and is fair and equitable with respect to each class of claims or interests. A bankruptcy court couldn't approve the plan unless all of the small business's disposable income, excluding amounts necessary for the payment of ordinary operating expenses, is applied to the plan over a three to five year period. Mr. Chairman, as you well know, our, district de our districts depend on their small businesses. They are convenience stores, restaurants, and pharmacies. Those who endeavor to open and run a small business are proud of their work and their standing in our communities. Unfortunately, they also take on a sometimes insurmountable financial burden. When they are forced to close, it has a great impact on the community. I'm proud to join you, Mr. Chairman, in introducing the Small Business Reorganization Act to provide an important avenue of relief to the people in our communities who employ countless individuals and who drive our local economies. And with that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Klein. Representative Delgado is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Cicilline. I also want to uh, thank the Ranking Member Stanson Brenner as well as Chairman Nadler and Ranking Member Collins and the entire uh, subcommittee for the invitation. Uh, I appreciate you holding this hearing to make sure our nation's bankruptcy laws reflect today's economy and represent the experiences of our nation's farmers. I'm proud to represent New York's 19th uh, congressional district, which stretches nearly 8,000 square miles, is made up of 11 counties, and includes the beautiful Hudson Valley and Catskill Mountains. My district is the eighth most rural in the country and the third most rural represented by a Democrat. It is the home to more than 500 farms and 800, I'm sorry, 8,000 uh, farm operators and 5,000 farms. Uh, today I'm here to speak on behalf of family farmers across my district who, along with farmers across the country, are facing alarming rates of foreclosure during this down farm economy. I would like to take this opportunity to articulate for the committee exactly what a down farm economy looks like. Farmers are currently facing a fifth year of declining net farm income. Prices are low, inputs are high, and current trade policies make the future unknown. 2018 marked the fourth consecutive year of rising bankruptcy rates as a proportion of the farm population. 
In addition, at the 2018 Agriculture, Economic, and Outlook Foreign Trade Forum, the USDA chief economist said, quote, net farm income is expected to remain flat over the next 10 years, and when accounting for inflation, to fall in real terms, end quote. This is a down farm economy, and this story is not unique to New York 19 or upstate New York. This is an urgent national issue for our farmers. According to the National Farm Bureau, last year, just 498 farms filed for Chapter 12 bankruptcy compared to nearly 766,000 consumer filings through Chapter 7 and 13. Over the last 10 years, Chapter 7 and Chapter 13 uh, have, been seen, have seen 10 million total filings compared to just 5,039 Chapter 12 filings. It's clear the current debt cap has rendered the Chapter 12 an, an accessible tool for today's farm families. This farm economy is exacerbated by an outdated filing cap that leaves farmers without options to restructure or repay their debt. This is why I introduced the Family Farm Relief Act along with the ranking member, Mr. Sensenbrenner, and our colleagues on both sides of the aisle. H.R. 2336 is a bipartisan step to give these family farmers long overdue relief through Chapter 12. Chapter 12 debt relief was in fact originally written for family farmers experiencing a down farm economy. The rules, as written, allow for a seasonal repayment as farmers' incomes shift with the seasons. Our legislation modifies Chapter 12 bankruptcy rules to increase the debt cap for eligibility from $3,237,000 to $10 million. These changes reflect the increase in land values as well as the growth over time in the average size of U.S. farming operations. These changes will provide farmers additional options to manage the current farm economy. Lifting the cap will allow farmers to retain assets and continue farm operation. The Family Farm Relief Act, which also has a bipartisan Senate counterpart, has the support of important voices in the farming community, including the American Farm Bureau Federation, and the National Farmers Union. Upon introduction, the American Farm Bureau said this legislation, quote, will help to align bankruptcy law with the scale and credit needs of U.S. agriculture, end quote. The National Farmers Union also joined in endorsing this, the Family Farm Relief Act, saying that it, quote, will help more family farmers avoid liquidation or foreclosure, allowing them to stay in operation, end quote. This legislation aims to do just that, keep farmers operational. Allowing farmers increased flexibility is critical to the health and wellness of our family farmers and the upstate economy at large. I encourage the committee to mark up this legislation and bring it to the House floor so we can give our farmers and growers the flexibility they need to continue operations. Thank you all again for the opportunity to testify today to address how we can aid our farmers in this difficult farm economy. I look forward to working with you all to advance the Family Farm Relief Act. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Delgado. In uh, keeping with our committee's practice, the witnesses are at this point excused. We thank you very much for coming here today to share your thoughts about this various pieces of legislation, and thank you for your leadership on this very important issue. Uh, this was very informative to the committee and will certainly guide us as we consider these legislative proposals. Thank you again. Uh, the witnesses for the second panel will please take your seats after our staff have made the administrative arrangements, which is code for t uh, placing your name cards on the table. Thank you and welcome to our witnesses. Our first witness on our second panel is Hollister Petraeus. 
Ms. Petraeus retired from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in 2017 after spending six years as the Director of the Office of Service Member Affairs, where she worked to strengthen consumer protection measures for the military, veterans, and their families. Prior to joining the CFPB, Ms. Petraeus served as the Director of BBB Military Line, a program of the Council of Better Business Bureaus that fosters outreach between local Better Business Bureaus and military communities. She currently sits on the Board of Directors of the Children of Fallen Patriots Foundation and the Board of Governors of the National Military Family Association. Ms. Petraeus received her bachelor's degree from Dickinson College and is a recipient of the Department of Defense Medal for Distinguished Public Service. Welcome. The second witness on our panel is Robert Keach, who appears on behalf of the American Bankruptcy Institute. He is a shareholder at Bernstein, Schur, Sawyer, and Nelson, and focused on bankruptcy reorganization and out-of-court workouts. He has appeared before bankruptcy courts in seven districts across New England, New York, and California, has been a panelist for national bankruptcy, lender liability, and creditors' rights programs. Mr. Keach serves as the president of the ABI from 2009 to 2010 and is currently an adjunct professor teaching cross-border insolvency and business bankruptcy at Boston College Law School. He received his BA from the University of Vermont and his JD from the University of Maine School of Law. Our next witness is Edward Boltz, representing the National Association of Consumer Bankruptcy Attorneys. Mr. Boltz currently serves as an attorney and managing partner at the law offices of John Orcutt. There, he represents consumers across a broad spectrum of financial matters, including Chapter 7 and 13 bankruptcies, mortgage issues, and student loan legislation. Mr. Boltz is also the Vice President of NACBA, a position he has held since 2007. At various points, he has served as the NACBA's Director, President, and Co-Chair of the Legislative Committee as well. Mr. Boltz received his BA from Washington University in St. Louis and his JD from George Washington University Law School. Our third witness is John Rayo, who appears on behalf of the National Consumer Law Center. Mr. Rayo has been a staff attorney at NCLC since 1996, focusing on consumer credit, mortgage servicing, and bankruptcy issues. He provides testimony to Congress and federal regulatory agencies on issues affecting low-income consumers and has filed amicus briefs in cases before the Supreme Court and various courts of appeal. Before joining NCLC, he was a managing attorney at the Providence Office of Rhode Island Legal Services, heading the program's consumer unit. He received his BA from Boston University and his JD from the University of California Hastings College of Law. A special welcome to you, Mr. Ayo. Uh, our fifth witness is Professor Jimenez, a professor at the University of California, Irvine School of Law. Professor Jimenez's research focuses on bankruptcy, consumer financial distress, and financial product regulation, and their intersection with consumer protection and access to justice. She was a founding staffer with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, where she worked on debt relief, credit reporting, and student loan issues. She received her MS from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and her JD from Harvard Law School, where she won the Outstanding Bankruptcy Student Award from the American Bankruptcy Institute. Welcome. Our last witness today is Judge Thomas Small, who is representing the National Bankruptcy Conference. Judge Small served as a bankruptcy judge for the Eastern District of North Carolina from 1982 to 2007, and as chief judge from 1992 to 1999, and again from 2006 to 2007. From 2001 to, 2000, 2000 to 2001, he served as president of the National Conference of Bankruptcy Judges and chaired the U.S. Judicial Conference Advisory Committee on Bankruptcy Rules from 2000 to 2004. Additionally, since 2007, Judge Small has sat on the board of editors of the Collier on Bankruptcy Treatise. He received his BA from Duke University and his JD from the Wake Forest University School of Law. We welcome all of our very distinguished witnesses on the second panel and thank you for participating in today's hearing. Now, if you would please rise, I will begin by swearing you in. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God? Let the record show the witnesses answered in the affirmative. You may be seated, thank you. Please note that each of your written statements will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. To help you stay within that time, there's a timing light on your table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals that your five minutes have expired. Ms. Ms. Petraeus will begin with you. You're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Cicilline, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, Chairman Nadler, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today, most notably on the Haven Act, which was recently introduced by Representatives McBath and Stubbe. Let me say up front that I'm not a bankruptcy expert, nor a lawyer. 
but I do have a long history of advocating for the military on consumer financial matters. I'm the daughter, wife, and mother of Army officers. As I lived a life of constant moves and more recently combat deployments, I saw the impact those events had on the finances of military personnel and their families. During the first year of the Iraq War, my husband's division went to war. I saw the family's financial challenges firsthand during that year, not just those of the active duty troops, but also families of the Guard and Reserve who came to our Family Assistance Center for help. I did what I could to help raise awareness with our federal and state legislators who visited. I also worked with local business leaders to include the Better Business Bureau, which led to the job that I held there for six years. Running BBB Military Line was an education for me on the fact that many scammers specifically target the military for their steady paycheck, which is often coupled with youth and financial inexperience. While I was at the BBB, we developed a number of free financial readiness workshops to provide in-person financial education for service members and their families. But while education is important, the sad truth is that in many cases, service members' finances are impacted by events that they cannot control. Um, deployments, shoddy loan servicing, inaccurate credit reporting, and the flouting of important consumer financial laws. So when I was offered the opportunity to head up the Office of Service Member Affairs at the newly formed Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, I jumped at the chance. I knew that the Bureau had the power to enforce consumer financial laws, and that to me was a vital part of protecting military families' hard-earned money. I ran that office for six years, and in that time, we saw over $120 million returned to service members. Last year, I was asked to join an American Bankruptcy Institute task force on veterans and service members. One of its most immediate missions was to correct a glaring error in the Bankruptcy Code of 2005, language that effectively denied disabled veterans the protections it provided to all other disabled Americans. Under the 2005 law, judges could no longer decide <clears throat> what was a debtor's disposable income, but had to include virtually all income that the debtor received, except for three things, benefits received under the Social Security Act, payments to victims of war crimes, and payments to victims of terrorism. That first item is the problem. Civilians received disability benefits from the Social Security Administration, but disabled service members and veterans do not. They get their disability benefits from the VA and from the Department of Defense. So by using specific language referencing the Social Security Act, Congress effectively denied those who had become disabled in the service of their country the rights given to others who had not served. And that is obviously not right. I cannot imagine that Congress intended this, but with their disability pensions counted, veterans may fail the means test and not qualify for Chapter 7 bankruptcy, which allows for a quick, fresh start. Instead, they must file for Chapter 13 with a three to five year payment plan that they must fund from their current monthly income, including their military disability pension. Surely Congress never intended that a military disability benefit should go into the pockets of creditors? The Haven Act will fix that problem. Let me also mention one other item you're considering for National Guard and Reserve members, combat deployment, while a source of extra pay could have a catastrophic impact on their civilian small business. But if they opted for bankruptcy, the means test counted their military special pay and allowances even though they were no longer receiving them. That could make their income too high for bankruptcy. The National Guard and Reservist Debt Relief Act of 2008 fixed that issue, and today you're looking to extend it for another four years, an action I support. Our citizen soldiers who put on the uniform of our country should not be financially penalized for doing so. Ideally, no one should need to declare bankruptcy, but it happens, and at a higher rate for veterans. Many of them have disabilities that make it hard to earn a living wage, and that may limit their caregiver spouse, too. No veteran should face the added stress of pledging their disability benefits to creditors. You can eliminate the roadblocks and make it harder for them to discharge their debts. And I commend you, <clears throat> excuse me, for your efforts today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Petraeus. Uh, Mr. Keech is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, would you just please put on your microphone? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Cicilline, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and Chairman Nadler, distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to present the views of the American Bankruptcy Institute in support of the several bipartisan bankruptcy measures now pending before the subcommittee. 
ABI is the world's largest association of professionals practicing in the area of corporate restructuring and personal bankruptcy, with nearly 11,000 members worldwide. I was honored to serve as the co-chair of the ABI's commission to study the reform of Chapter 11. The 400-page report of the Chapter 11 commission was the product of more than three years of study on how best to improve and modernize the bankruptcy code, with input from all sectors and viewpoints. The report has been an influential resource for stakeholders and cited by numerous federal courts, including the Supreme Court, and inspires reform efforts like the bipartisan bicameral items on today's agenda. Um, others will speak on, on some of these bills, but let me focus on two, uh, the Family Farmer Relief Act and the Small Business Reorganization Act. The ABI endorses and urges passage of the Family Farmer Relief Act. This bipartisan and bicameral legislation would increase the debt limits for the filing of Chapter 12 cases from the existing limits, now about 4.1 million to 10 million. Since its enactment in the midst of the severe farm crisis in 1986, Chapter 12 has been a useful and durable support for the cyclical and economic challenges faced in American agriculture. The original debt limit for Chapter 12 eligibility was $1.5 million. That was set in 1986. However, today's farming operations are larger Farming has become much more expensive due to the need to access technology. Accordingly, debt loads are much larger, given the capital requirements for farmland equipment and inputs. As a result, the liability cap under Chapter 12, which has, has been increased for cost of living and other factors over the years, does not align with modern credit and risk environment associated with family farming. This bill would increase that cap to 10 million, which we think is long overdue. A crisis in this sector is already unfolding. Uncertainties in both the trade and commodities markets as well as the impact of natural disasters um, makes this an ideal time to reset Chapter 12 before a larger crisis arrives. Um, I would also, uh, Mr. Chairman, move to admit a letter from the American College of Bankruptcy uh, in support of the Chapter 12 reform. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Let me speak also briefly about the Small Business Reorganization Act. Chapter 11 of the Bankruptcy Code has long been of great value in preserving going concern value jobs and maximizing creditor recoveries for many businesses. Small businesses are the entities that drive job creation in a dynamic economy, but they're also most likely to experience financial distress. As Congress looks to find ways to help small businesses enter the marketplace and create jobs, it should also focus on helping existing businesses succeed and save jobs that otherwise would be lost if those businesses close their doors. The Small, the small Business Reorganization Act of 2019 is a good start, and we thank Representative Klein and, and Chairman Cicilline for sponsoring it in the House. This is the jobs bill that is already paid for. It costs us nothing to make the bankruptcy system work better for small business. With some tweaking, it can be an even more effective remedy. The testimony before the ABI Commission strongly established that the Chapter 11 process simply does not work for small and medium-sized business businesses. Witnesses testified consistently that small businesses were running away from Chapter 11. Uh, and those that filed were filing, frankly, merely to, to facilitate a quick liquidation. Only 27% of small businesses that file Chapter 11 confirm plans. Why is the Chapter 11 in its existing form not working? It's simply too complex and too costly for these businesses. More importantly, current doctrines that apply in Chapter 11 mean that it is a virtual certainty that the existing owners of the business will not get to retain uh, their ownership interests uh, in reorganizing under Chapter 11. The Small Business Reorganization Act fixes those problems. However, like the Chapter 12 bill, uh, we think its debt limit is somewhat too low at, at $2.6 million. ABI would encourage that the same change be made to this bill and in increase in the debt limit to $10 million um, for small businesses. Um, the data studied by the ABI Commission seem to establish that as the right level to encompass the businesses that need help. Here, too, I would like to introduce letters from the American College of Bankruptcy and the National Conference of Bankruptcy Judges in support of this legislation. Without objection, so ordered. And my time is about up, but I would just take the, my, my last uh, statement to also uh, note that the ABI supports the Haven Act, and we would like to submit uh, letters from the American College of Bankruptcy in support of the Haven Act as well. Thank you, Mr. Keach. The chair now recognizes Mr. Boltz for five minutes. 
On behalf of NACBA, I want to thank Chair Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Collins of the Judiciary Committee, and Chairman Cicilline and Ranking Member Sens Sensenbrenner of this subcommittee for the opportunity to offer our views on the state of consumer bankruptcy and also pending legislative proposals. While there are many issues related to consumer bankruptcy in play in both the courts and throughout the economy as a whole, I will limit my remarks to some currently pending legislation directly related to bankruptcy, as well as, well as several other topics to which proposed legislation may serve as effective vehicles for essential change. Firstly, we would like to talk about the restore bankruptcy, restoring the bankruptcy discharge for student loans. NACBA, through its members and, and more importantly, its clients, is often the f first to see economic troubles affecting Americans. In 2007, NACBA, with the Center for Responsible Lending and the Consumer Federation of America, released a survey finding that there was a sharp so rise in subprime mortgage-related problems. Shortly thereafter, we hit the Great Recession caused by the housing crash. In 2012, again, NACBA first forecast the coming student debt bomb. Since then, student debt has, has skyrocketed to over $1.5 trillion, and the amount of student loan debt now surpasses all other consumer debt, with the exception of mortgage debt. In response to this unabated growth of, student, of this student loan crisis and greater questions about higher education, there have been numerous proposals, both large and small. While the Department of Justice, after consultation with NACBA, among others, has given guidelines about allowing Chapter 13 debtors to participate in various income-driven repayment plans during their bankruptcies, such plans have often faced resistance from bankruptcy courts as purportedly constituting unfair discrimination. Additionally, in February 2018, the Department of Education issued a request for information regarding its application of the undue hardship standard currently under the bankruptcy code. Despite more than 400 responses highlighting the harsh effects of this standard submitted more than a year ago, there, ha there have been no results, let alone any changes in the practices by the Department of Education in this regard. Additional congressional oversight of the Department of Education would be welcome. These minimum efforts, however, show the inadequacy of piecemeal, non-comprehensive changes that stop short of restoring the general dischargeability of student loans and bankruptcy. Furthermore, while government loan programs generally tend lend to borrowers without regard to creditworthiness, private student loans are largely underwritten on the same basis as other consumer debts, without, with lending risks reflected in the interest rates charged, as well as requiring co-signers, often, often parents or elderly grandparents, and other demands for security. Research indicates that the non-dischargeability of private student loans made in 2005 by BAPSIPA did not result in the lowering of interest rates by student borrowers, in large part because there is no showing of, a, of strategic default by borrowers prior to BAPSIPA or since. Restoration of the discharge of bankruptcy for student loans and private student loans would help restore the most debt burden of those and make them economically functional again. For these reasons, we support Senator Durbin and, and the House Bill H.R. 2648 that would restore the complete discharge. We also would support, as a smaller step, H.R. 885, which would restore the dischargeability of private student loans. In regard to the Haven Act, the Bankruptcy Code uses a means test as a, to determine the projected disposable income a debtor has to pay to unsecured creditors. These tests are based on current monthly income, which excludes the debtor's Social Security Act. Both Social Security and disability retirement benefits are excluded based on the protections outside of bankruptcy from collection by any creditors, with the sole exception largely being student loans. Debtors receiving, receiving veterans disability benefits as well as veterans retirement benefits have these same protections outside of bankruptcy, as do other forms of public retirement benefits such as railroad workers, and certain public school workers. As written in an article earlier, pu published earlier today, many of these people are worse off in bankruptcy than they would be outside of bankruptcy. For these reasons, NACBA supports the Haven Act, but would encourage this subcommittee to look at expanding such to cover not just disability benefits, but also veterans' retirement benefits. We do recognize that, that that should be capped, however, at the amount of the maximum amount of Social Security so as to not provide a windfall for retirees with substantial benefits otherwise. I thank you for your, for your time and, and, and. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bolso. The chair now recognizes Mr. Rayo for five minutes. Chairman Cicilline, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner. Please put on your microphone. Thanks. Chairman Cicilline, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner. 
um, and Chairman Nadler, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. While there are a number of bills uh, and proposals before this committee that are worthy of consideration, including those in the report of the ABI's Commission on Consumer Bankruptcy, I wish to voice my strong support for Chairman Nadler's Student Borrower Bankruptcy Relief Act, and we'll focus on that bill. When the bankruptcy discharge for student loans was eliminated in the Higher Education Reauthorization Act in 1998, <clears throat> the conference report stated that some protections still remain for borrowers in the form of undue hardship. While this was a questionable pre premise even then, we now know with certainty that undue hardship is effectively a non-existent right. It is virtually never used. One study has found that only one-tenth of one percent of bankruptcy filers with student loan debt seek an undue hardship discharge. The barriers to getting an undue hardship discharge are enormous and deny access to those most in relief. Some will suggest borrowers would try for, uh, would more, more borrowers would try for undue hardship if Congress defined it in a way that will allow courts to apply a more lenient standard. No matter how defined, the undue hardship method of discharge will be random and arbitrary. In the two circuits where a less stringent test is currently used, student borrowers fare no better in the outcomes of their cases and no more cases are brought in those circuits. Even with a less strict standard, the burden is on student borrower to bring a court action and prove that their loan should be discharged. Any system that requires the poorest and most in need to come up with thousands, even tens of thousands of dollars to fund contested litigation will not work. Are, this economic reality alone explains why no cases are brought now and why none will be brought under a redefined standard. Another reason given in 1998 for changing the law was that borrowers in financial distress could rely upon the Department of Education's income-driven repayment plans. We now know after many years of experience that these programs are fraught with problems and their reach is limited. Many eligible borrowers are not enrolled in these plans despite clear potential benefits. Instead, borrowers are steered by servicers into forbearances and deferments which causes their balances to grow as interest continues to accrue and is capitalized. Services do this because it is more profitable for them as it is much easier to put someone on a forbearance than to enroll them in an income-driven repayment plan. Making bankruptcy dischargeable uh, or making bankruptcy discharge available to borrowers would incentivize servicers to act more responsibly. But even if servicer problems were fixed, it makes no sense to keep borrowers who might otherwise seek bankruptcy relief on an IDR for 20 years when they would be paying, especially those who don't have repayment ability, to be paying nothing or some minimal amount. The administrative cost of annual recertifications and collection costs if the debtor redefaults is a waste of taxpayer funds and further drains the student loan program. As each of the bankruptcy discharge for student lo loans was eliminated over the period 1977 to 2005, there was no evidence of abuse by con uh, consumer borrowers. The debate was moved by perception rather than reality. Still, any concern about the potential abuse is even less compelling now because of the substantial changes that were made in the bankruptcy code in 2005, including a means test, document requirements, exemption limitations. The question remains, why are student loans treated differently? The government financially supports a number of loan programs with laudable goals similar to student loan, such as programs for, loan programs for veterans, farmers, small business owners, and home buyers. While many of these programs also have less strict underwriting, some, somehow we treat them differently uh, and make them non-dischargeable. Some argue that this is because student loans help borrowers obtain a college degree, which is an asset that they will guarantee future income. This ignores the many student borrowers who are struggling with large amounts of debt and never completed their schooling or obtained a degree. Even those borrowers who obtain a degree fall, uh, run into unexpected life traumas or other circumstances that prevent them from having sufficient incomes to repay their loans. In conclusion, it is time to directly confront the myths about student loan dischargeability and rebut the rationales for treating student loans differently in bankruptcy. Congress should reverse this policy and act immediately to ensure that student loans are, are not exempted from discharge. Thank you, Chairman.
Thank you, Mr. Rayo. The chair now rec recognizes Professor Jimenez for five minutes. Chairman Ciceline, member, uh, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to express my views to you today. In the few minutes before you, I want to urge the subcommittee to approve bills that would make the bankruptcy discharge available to all student loan borrowers. The $1.5 trillion in outstanding student loans and the rising defaults are symptoms of structural problems that bankruptcy cannot solve. Bankruptcy, however, is well suited to bring relief to individuals who are today suffering greatly under the weight of this crushing system. I want to make the case for dischargeability of private student loans first and then focus on rebutting objections to the dischargeability of federal loans. In 2005, owners of private student loan debt received a tremendous gift. With the stroke of a pen, the $56 billion of outstanding private loans that were originated at a time when those loans were immediately dischargeable in bankruptcy suddenly became practically non-dischargeable. Uh, non -dischargeable. There was no economic justification for doing this, none. What did the American people get from this? A few studies examined the effect of the 2005 amendments on the private student loan market, including two studies that I co-authored. To summarize them, basically making private student loans presumptively non-dischargeable harmed students. It increased the cost of the loans, it did not translate into savings for subprime borrowers, and it was done despite any evidence of opportunistic behavior by private student loan borrowers. Since 2005, private lenders have increased their requirements for co-borrowers by 1.5 times. In 2005, it was 60% of undergraduate loans had a co-borrower. Now it's over 90%. What does the market look like today? Well, interest rates range from 0 to 20%, and defaults are quite low, similar to credit cards, around 2%. This is very different from federal student loans that have about 11% default. And less than 2%, this is the only data we have from 2005 to 11, less than 2% of private student loans are included in a bankruptcy filing. The special treatment of private student loans in bankruptcy is utterly indefensible, and I urge you to end it. And I now want to address some of the arguments against discharging federal loans, in, federal student loans in bankruptcy. Typical one is the student, the student benefited from the education at the expense of the creditor, and thus they ought to be obligated to repay. But that's an argument against bankruptcy discharge generally, and it ignores in this context the public benefits of a well-educated citizenry. Another common objection is that students will get loans, graduate, and file bankruptcy as quickly as possible. But there has never been any empirical evidence of any widespread abuse. And in fact, the times that uh, the individual uh, anecdotes that people point to are of cases in which the, the bankruptcy judge denied a discharge. That objection also ignores the moral hazard consequences of the current system on creditors and servicers. These players yield tremendous power by virtue of their treatment in bankruptcy and lack, therefore, market incentives to improve their treatment of students. Theorized objections to changing the system ignore the real-life consequences of bankruptcy. Filing bankruptcy is expensive. It affects the cost and availability of important products like obtaining credit, insurance, living arrangements, and job prospects for years to come. These arguments also ignore the many tools the bankruptcy system already has to control abuse means testing, good faith requirements, limit on how, how often someone can obtain a bankruptcy discharge, among others. Another argument for the status quo is that making these loans dischargeable would compromise the viability of the student loan program. But that argument assumes that making the discharge available for federal borrowers would precipitate massive numbers of the 45 million student loan borrowers to file bankruptcy. This would require astronomical growth in bankruptcy filings, which at their height saw about 2 million people filing. The numbers just don't add up. Second, this argument assumes that the availability, availability of federal student loans depends on repayment. But the funding of the federal student loan program is a political question. It does not depend on the fiscal solvency of the program itself. The real question is, where do American people think their government should invest? I'd argue that higher education is one such place, although we do not necessarily need to do it through loans. Changing the bankruptcy treatment of these student loans would allow, um, would allow us to, to focus on the people who are suffering the most. I urge you to report these bills positively out of the subcommittee and to amend the bankruptcy code immediately to make all student loans dischargeable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Jimenez. I now recognize Judge Small for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Sensenbrenner committee members. National Bankruptcy Conference is grateful for the opportunity to participate at this hearing this morning to present its views 
with respect to small business reorganizations. As a bankruptcy judge, I saw this problem firsthand and have known for over 30 years that Chapter 11 doesn't work well for small businesses. Chapter 11 is too expensive, confirmation requirements are too onerous, creditors have too much control of the process. House Bill 3311, which incorporates the essential aspects of the National Bankruptcy Conference's proposal, would remedy all of these problems and provide incentives and procedures for debtors and creditors to arrive at consensual plans. Uh, there would be a new voluntary subchapter, subchapter 5 of chapter 11, that small business enterprises could use to reorganize. The debtor would be a debtor in possession, but in every case there would be a standing trustee, much like in chapter 11, or chapter 12. Only the debtor could file a plan, and the plan must be filed quickly, within 90 days. There would not be a creditors committee in most cases. There would be no disclosure statement unless the court ordered otherwise. But even without a disclosure statement, the debtor would have to provide a lot of information, including all of the information and periodic reports that small business debtors now provide under Chapter 11. A confirmed plan under Chapter or Subchapter 5 may be either consensual or non-consensual. If the plan meets most of the current Chapter 11 requirements, including the high voting requirements, the plan would be confirmed and the case would proceed as if it were a regular Chapter 11 case. The trustee would disappear and the debtor would receive a discharge upon substantial consummation. If the debtor cannot meet the requirements for a consensual plan, the plan can still be confirmed if it meets subchapter 5's cram-down requirements, the most important of which is that the plan must provide that all of the debtor's projected disposable income be received in a three to five year period as determined by the court and be applied to uh, make payments under the plan. If the court confirms a non-consensual plan, the trustee remains in place and monitors compliance with the plan and the debtor's discharge will be delayed until all plan payments are made. Now, the National Bankruptcy Conference tried really hard to make this a balanced proposal that would benefit both debtors and creditors. I mean, obviously, resor um, reorganization will be more feasible for small businesses, but there are benefits for creditors as well. For one thing, every subchapter 5 case has an impartial, independent, standing trustee who provides oversight of the debtor's operations. Every Every case will move fast. Debtors will not be allowed to languish in Chapter 11. And the plan may provide for specific remedies, including liquidation, that can be executed by the uh, trustee if the debtor fails to meet its obligations under the plan. And most importantly, reorganizations would avoid liquidations and asset values would be preserved. Now, in 1985, I had the privilege of testifying before uh, with my late colleague, uh, bankruptcy judge Thomas Moore, before two Senate Judiciary Committee subcommittees looking into bankruptcy and, farm, and the farm crisis. Our message in 1985 was that Chapter 11 did not work well for family farmers and what was needed was a new chapter to deal with their specific problems. Today my message with respect to small businesses is similar. Chapter 11 does not work well for small businesses and legislation is needed. Chapter 12 saved thousands of family farms for the benefit of family farmers and their creditors. And I strongly believe that today, House Bill 3311 would save thousands of small businesses for the benefit of their owners, their creditors, their suppliers, their customers, their employees, and the economy as a whole. And I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Judge Small. Uh, thank you all to all the witnesses for your opening statements. We will now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions. And I will begin by recognizing the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. I thank the chairman for holding this important hearing. Bankruptcy reform for vulnerable groups has gone overlooked for too long. And gathering the experts we have before us today is an important step towards passing meaningful legislation and fixing the problems they've 
uh, that they have testified about. Make no mistake, we're here because the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. After decades of adding pro-Wall Street laws to the books, we've settled into a system with loopholes that stacked the deck against fairness for people in bankruptcy proceedings. The so-called bankruptcy abuse protection, or excuse me, Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act passed in 2005 made student loan debt non-dischargeable in bankruptcy. This legislation should have been called the Bankruptcy Protection for Private Lenders for For-Profit Colleges and Universities Act because the private lenders were the ones who benefited the most from making student loans non-dischargeable in bankruptcy. And Ms. Jimenez, you say that it was 56 billion on the books at the time the 2005 legislation passed. That was a gift, a panacea uh, for the private uh, loan industry. And these so-called uh, schools that they lent money for student loans to often had humongous advertising budgets they swept in a bunch of unqualified students. They accepted everybody, regardless of whether or not you could read or not. And uh, when you finished matriculating, the diploma that you received was not worth the paper that it was written on. Graduates had degrees but couldn't find a job. As a result of this change in federal law, people are stuck paying back these student loans for the rest of their lives. Even, even gambling debt is dischargeable, but student loan debt is not dischargeable. Even timeshare debt is dischargeable in bankruptcy, but student loan debt is not. I'm proud to be a uh, co-sponsor of Chairman Nadler's bill. Um, uh, it's H.R. 2648, uh, the Student Borrower Protection excuse me, Student Borrower Bankruptcy Relief Act of 2019. I'm proud to be co-sponsor of that bill and I hope that it will pass. It's time to take steps to ensure that groups such as these students are uh, protected and I'm looking forward uh, to hearing uh, about the solutions that we're testifying about today. Uh, Ms. Jimenez, uh, well, actually, Mr. Boltz, in your testimony, you discussed the development of bankruptcy law in the realm of student loans, com commenting about Congress uh, having made it increasingly difficult to discharge student loans. Why do you think uh, that uh, was the case? Why did Congress do that, Mr. Boltz? And if you're Is it on your microphone? Mr. Johnson, as best I, I know, that most of the changes that made student loans dischargeable were made in bills that were not even through, through, this, through the Judiciary Committee. They were often in a Higher Education Act. Some of the changes were made in crime why, bills. Why, did, why was this change made? Though? And it was often made uh, as part of a deal to increase um, the amount of lending that was available on the idea that the, the, the poorest people who were unable to pay, if we kept them on the books, that somehow that would increase the liquidity of the student loan program. Ms. As Ms. Jimenez has testified, that's really not the case. Well, what do you say about it, uh, Ms. Jimenez? Why did they do that? Um, I think it's partly as we opened up, uh, talking about federal loans first, or, or government-guaranteed loans, as we opened up more and more uh, federal loans available to students and um, asked didn't ask about their uh, ability to repay, um, then it was basically the boogeyman story that uh, people are going to come in and start filing bankruptcy, you know, start going to school, graduate. Do you think it was, let me ask you, do you think it was to protect the, uh, the lenders uh, more than to protect borrowers and shore up the system? What, what do you think the real uh, motivation was for passing the legislation? Looks to me like it was uh, to protect uh, those who were giving the campaign contributions to those uh, who were passing the laws. But I'll move on. Mr. Rao, according to a recent study, black men and women who take out loans to finance their education are forced to take out more money than their white peers. 
What is the reason for this disparate impact on minority populations, and how can we in Congress work to stop it? The gentleman's time has expired, but the witness may answer the question. Yes, uh, Mr. Johnson. I would say that, um, you know, actually, Professor Jimenez has done a lot of research on this, and there's been a lot of um, evidence that um, minority families um, have lack uh, the same amount of resources uh, that some white families will and will often be required to incur uh, additional debt. They're also going to often to private schools which uh, charge more, and there are actually a number of reasons that Professor Jimenez has outlined in her research, so thank, thank you. Thank you, and I yield back. I thank, thank you, Ed. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Sensenbrenner, for five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I've been on this committee since I was first elected to Congress in 1978. Uh, before I was elected to Congress, there was a major redo of the bankruptcy code that was passed in 78. And that made student loans non-dischargeable. Uh, I believe in 82 or 83, this committee, which was still heavily run by Democrats, made the loans non-dischargeable. Now, at that time, there was very little federal uh, lending, and most of the lending were guaranteed student loans through the private banking sector. But I remember the debate uh, when that happened that said that there were a lot of graduates, particularly those with advanced degrees, uh, that were filing for bankruptcy to discharge their student loans even before the ink was dry on the diplomas they got for getting an advanced degree. I think most of us agree that a college education is a way to have increased income and an advanced degree is a way to have even better advanced incomes. And I think with the exception of you, Ms. Petraeus, uh, everybody here has a law degree um, on that. And that might have been the motivation of a while ago when you decided to go to law school. Now, my question is, is yes, there is a problem with student loans, defaulted student loans. But if we make them non-dischargeable, how do we prevent people who have a diploma that will get them having, you know, six-figure incomes uh, in their practices from gaming the system and getting the major part of their debt discharged when that debt ended up uh, uh, giving them the opportunity for significantly increased income if they did not have those degrees. So who would like to be first? Because <laughs> we cannot repeat that mistake. If we repeat that mistake, you know, the American taxpayers will rise up saying, you know, uh, the federal government lent them money and they had no intention of paying it back as the bankruptcy court was across the street. Ranking member Sensenbrenner, that problem that you address, even though I don't acknowledge that it did exist, was fixed in 2005 by the, bank, the, the amendments that Mr. Johnson referred to. While many of them have made bankruptcy filing much more difficult, they absolutely address the issue you're talking about, someone coming right out of college with the doctor, with the six uh, income figures. That person would never be able to get a discharge under our current bankruptcy law. The means test would preclude that person, forgetting whether it's student loan or any other debt, they would never be able to get a discharge. The reports of abuse, and in, in, uh, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, you refer to 1978. This Judiciary Committee asked for a GAO study to be done to look at how much student loan was being discharged in bankruptcy when it was dischargeable. And that study showed that there was virtually no abuse. But then the why did the Judiciary Committee turn around and make it non-dischargeable? Actually, it, 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 it didn't. It, this committee did not vote in favor of it. Eventually, it was included at, as, a, at, as a compromise with a GAO study. And then all the other changes were not done by but, this committee. They were done by the higher education committees. OK, this, you know, this, this doesn't answer my question. You know, if we make student loans dischargeable again, how do we prevent a gaming of the system? Now, if you look at a means test on this, you know, you, you, know, you walk out of med school or you walk out of law school, you know, you don't have, you know, bags of money, unless you've got a trust fund, you know, sit, sitting around. So most people will be able uh, to qualify under a means test because their income is not very much. 
and their assets are probably negative. So how do we do that? Because you know the, the key to getting this passed is to figure out how to prevent people from gaming the system. And if we just say, well, nobody ever did that in the past, sir, you're in denial and you are having this proposal, which I think has got some merit to it if it's properly done, leading it down to defeat. Now, somebody else in my remaining 24 seconds? Yeah, Ms. Emma. Can I answer? Um, so I, I want to talk about both the idea that this is something that will happen, um, and, uh, and even if it did, that we cannot stop it. The means test didn't just um, create barriers based on income, as you were just referring to, um, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner. It also added um, uh, bad faith and dismissal for cause provisions to the code under both Chapter 7 and 13 and 11 that allow a bankruptcy judge to take into account exactly the circumstances that you're afraid of, the person who graduates and then you know, doesn't currently have a job, so has no income, but has very good prospects. In that situation, and there are a few other things in the bankruptcy code, the, the judge can dismiss those cases or deny a discharge in general or a discharge of that particular debt. Hey, well, my time is up, but I'm a skeptic. You gotta convince me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sensenman. The chair now recognizes the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Nadler, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I ask my question, I want to note for the record that Professor Jimenez interrupted her stay with her family in Germany to fly back yesterday so she could participate in today's hearing, which was rescheduled from last week. I thank, I think all of us very much appreciate your significant efforts, and we are glad you're with us today. Uh, now my question. Among the staggering statistics you cite in your prepared testimony are the following. One in five adults have student loans, and approximately 20% of the outstanding amount of these loans are in default. What impact do these factors have on a nation's economy? Thank you for the question, um, Representative Nadler. I, there is abundant evidence um, that, these, uh, that, that the number of defaults and the amount of student debt that people are holding are um, delaying marriage, purchasing of homes, um, not uh, uh, people are choosing not to go into public service careers. Um, they're choosing to uh, uh, delay all sorts of purchases, including cars. Um, we live in a consumption economy, and we need consumers to actually uh, participate. And this is stopping that participation. Thank you. And as a result of your research, you have observed the disparate impact of student loan debt with respect to gender and race. Could you explain what those disparate impacts are and the principal factors causing them? Absolutely. So um, basically, this is just reproducing the, the, the racial gaps and the racial, sorry, the racial differences that we have in our society. The racial wealth gap in general is widening and, and is, is wide. And um, that means that, say, black borrowers are forced uh, to borrow student loans at higher rates than white borrowers because they don't have family wealth. Um, to support them. And um, they also tend to attend for-profit schools, which are uh, schools that are actually uh, marketing themselves more um, towards uh, blacks and um, uh, Latinos and um, women and, and people, uh, working people. Um, and they have much worse outcomes um, in terms of graduation rates, um, uh, employment rates, repayment rates, basically everything. Um, uh, you know, everything that, that would matter. Um, so the higher, higher education is sold as um, some kind of panacea out of, um, you know, poverty or uh, lower middle class. And that works for some people, um, but it doesn't work for everyone. And it's basically a bet that the student is taking. And sometimes that bet fails. Um, it happens to fail more often for uh, black and Latinos. Thank you. And um, uh, Mr. Rao, what are some of the so-called reforms enacted by the 2005 amendments to the Bankruptcy Code that make it more difficult for all consumers, let alone those with overwhelming student debt, to file for and, ba and obtain bankruptcy relief? Yes, uh, uh, Chairman Nadler. Um, the, the major change, of course, was the means test. But there were also, and so that means test requires all filers to uh, calculate their current monthly income. There's additional filing requirements, document requirements, and if you're above the median income in your state, you need to, you're subjected to the full means test, which does remove those who have an ability to repay. Uh, it, it creates a presumption of abuse and would deny, ultimately deny those folks a discharge. There are also changes for exemptions so that um, um, uh, particularly higher income 
consumers couldn't move to states with unlimited homesteads and hide assets in that way. Um, there were also counseling requirements that were imposed that would um, uh, haven't actually proven to done much in terms of, uh, of, of uh, really making a bankruptcy relief, uh, you know, having exposed those uh, individual debtors to other options. And, and as a result of these uh, reforms, if student loan obligations were made fully dischargeable, would the argument that such legislation would have invite abuse be even less compelling? Yes, absolutely. I think there, it, it would address that problem, which even though it, I, I say that it didn't exist, it certainly would address the problem of, of, of uh, thank you. And finally, filers. Thank you. And finally, Judge Small, um, you were a bankruptcy judge for many years. Um, based on that experience, what are your thoughts about the current law with respect to the dischargeability of student loans? It's almost impossible to discharge a student loan under, in, in most circuits under, under the Bruner undue hardship test. If, uh, uh, if you were not going to repeal 23A8, you should at least do something to make the standard of the Bruner test easier so that a debt could be discharged for hardship, maybe not undue hardship. Thank you very much. My time is five, four seconds from expiring. I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now I recognize the gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Armstrong. Thank you. Um, so I am a sponsor of uh, H.R. 236, the Family Farmer Relief Debt Act, and I think it's important because over the last 20 years, the increase in production from our farmers all across the country has gone up significantly. These are some of the best scientists and producers in, the, in any industry in the world. But at the same time, the decline in farm income um, combined with trade fluctuations has created a really difficult time for farmers. Um, and I think one of the reasons we don't notice the farm crisis that's actually going on right now, and partially because of the farm crisis in the 80s, is because there are less family farmers than there were 20 years ago. And some of that's because of prior farm, farm crises. Some of it's just based on economies of scale, which is where we get to a, re or a revamp of Chapter 12. According to the USDA, debt service ratios are projected to reach all-time highs very shortly. With the five-year 50% collapse in farm income, it's imperative that producers have adequate safety nets to rely upon should they need to make extra, the extraordinarily difficult decisions for their farm. In both 2017 and 2018, approximately 500 farms filed each year under Chapter 12 bankruptcy. The upper Midwest has witnessed a 19% increase in Chapter 12 filings since 2017, and that statistic does not include the effects of droughts, floods, and recent trade disputes. Just like any business, our, our egg producers need updated ex and flexible tools to reorganize their debt. Chapter 12 bankruptcy is an important and unique provision that allows farmers to restructure their debt while, while maintaining their farming operations and uniquely recognizes some of those challenges that are based on a, on a farm business income. Unfortunately, the current debt cap from Chapter 12, it's I think 4.1 million, uh, is, does not, uh, it unnecessarily excludes farmers' most des desperate need of reorganization. And just to be quite frank, it doesn't recognize what the current family farm looks like. By increasing the debt cap from Chapter 12 bankruptcy from 4 million to 10 million, this bill will keep more farmers in fields and farms and in the family. I always am I'm on a continual, continual quest to educate people about North Dakota, and one thing that I think is great is we do not have corporate farming. So every farm in North Dakota is a family farm. I will note this, this bill is particularly beneficial to my stage because we only have farming, family farms. Yet the effect of this bill will just be, won't, won't just be felt by farmers, but it's felt by the rural communities rely on them as an economic driver. Strong farms support strong rural communities, so we need to give them the tools that meet their needs in the current economy. Family farms are more than just a business. They're a commitment to a tradition passed down from generation to generation. We owe it to our farmers to make this simple change and stand with them when we need to make their mo the most difficult decisions. And I would just note that this, was, this bill was in um, desperate need of introduction prior to the, uh, what is going on in the farm community right now, and whether it's floods that are going on all across the country, droughts that some people are experiencing, and obviously the uncertain trade, trade situation that everybody faces. 
And last but not least is we've gone from a scenario where the family farmer can work on a $120,000 piece of equipment to a million dollar piece of equipment that is more computer than mechanical at this point. And inputs continue to rise, whether it's transportation and hydrous, all of these things. And so the, the number of acres you need to do to produce and, and, and have a valid family farm is going up every day. And they provide not only my region, my state, but every, but every state across the country with food and actually, quite frankly, feed the world. So um, I'm proud to be a part of that bill. Um, I will just say one thing that I, on the student loan debt, and I think it's something that we have to address, and that's that college tuition is increasing at an unsustainable rate. And it's all, it's, it, there's been a 213% in tuition from 1987 to 2017. And I, we have great colleges in North Dakota, we have great colleges all across the country, but I'm not sure they're getting 217% better education than those people who got in 1987 did. And there, are, there really are no market forces that drive down college tuition, but there are plenty of market, fo market forces that, that benefit schools increasing, whether it's a local chamber of commerce, state education. So we continue to grow these campuses. Oftentimes, employee, employment is, is going up at the, not quite 213%, but a very high rate. But the, the employment that's going on in college campuses isn't academic. It's more administrators, more deals with those. So when we deal with these student loan issues, we also have to figure out to put some kind of economic, I mean, it's a federally backed student loan. We have an econ we have an incentive in order to keep local college tuition costs down, and that has to be a part of this conversation. Otherwise, I worry that we open the floodgates to an ever-increasing tuition cost where we get into a situation where not only are we increasing college, college tuition everywhere, but we're not necessarily preparing our students for a 21st century workforce. So. I yield my time without asking a single question, and I don't think I've done that before. Very thoughtful comments. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman you're back, I now recognize the gentlelady from Washington, Ms. Jayapal. Thank you so minutes. much, Chairman Cicilline, for um, holding this hearing, and thank you to all of you for your comments. Um, you know, I am confused by the comments earlier about people gaming the system, because I feel like the student loan system is a giant trap. We say to people, you got to get an education. You know, K-12 used to be enough to get a good job. It isn't anymore. We all know that. We say to people, go get a trade or a vocational skill or do something. Get a four-year degree. And, and then they do that, but they come out with an average of forty dollars to $50,000 in debt. $1.5 trillion in student loan debt in this country. And when I think about gaming the system, I think about the fact that Actually, the federal government right now is charging so much on interest, so much more than we actually pay for that money, that many of these borrowers, I just, I got a whole bunch of tweets yesterday because we introduced our College for All bill. A whole bunch of these borrowers are telling me they're paying $700 a month for their principal payments, trying to pay off their student loans, and $4, $5 is actually going to principal. The rest of it is going to interest because we're charging these enormous interest rates for these students. So they're never going to be able to get out of debt. And when I think about, again, gaming the system, I wonder how it is that we can bail out Wall Street firms because they're supposedly too big to fail, but these student borrowers, 44 million people with student loan debt in this country today, are too small to fail. They can they can have their entire lives destroyed, no future, and yet somehow there's this different standard. And so let me ask you, you know, when big businesses fall on hard times, you've all talked about this, they can take advantage of the relief that bankruptcy offers. When, when students have the same problem, they cannot. That means an organization like the Trump administration, for example, the Trump organization, excuse me, can declare bankruptcy with taxpayer costs, any big organization, I'm not picking on Trump, um, any of them can declare bankruptcy, and somehow they're not gaming the system. And yet students are. So why aren't we worried about the gaming of the system with those big organizations? Or to the counter, why don't we say, look, to these students, we can give you the same benefits. So Mr. Bolson, your written testimony, you described this ever-increasing set of restrictions on how and when ordinary people can discharge their loans. What is any logical reason, like anyone, I will take any single logical reason for why clients with student debt should face this heavier, higher burden um, to discharge their student loans than major corporations? 
your mic. Thank you, Ms. Jayapal. In regard, particularly in regards to the private student loans, there is absolutely no basis for this whatsoever. When it comes to the federal loans, there is the argument that has been, that has been made and I think is, is not terribly solid that because the government is on the hook for, the, for these amounts that it affects the liquidity of making future loans. One of the things that's important to consider, however, of the $1.5 trillion in student loans, 11% of the borrowers of the 44 million people, they are in, de in default, which is a technical term under, in student loan law, which means they're more than nine months without a payment. More than a third of people are delinquent on their student loans. So what, part of what that means is that of the $1.5 trillion, the government is not going to ever see all of that. So there is a large fallacy that, the, that this is somehow going to undermine the, the ability to continue to make loans for students. And in fact, if we're really con concerned about the state of the economy, there are reports that say that if we were to cancel all $1.5 trillion in student loan debt, we would bring $1 trillion over the next 10 years into our economy. Even the Federal Reserve has said people are putting off major decisions like buying homes or investing in a car or whatever else they need, even getting married or having kids because of their student debt. Mr. Rao, you're an attorney at the National Consumer Law Center, and you pointed out that currently in bankruptcy law, the business entrepreneur is given an opportunity for a fresh start while the student borrower is given no margin of error. Do student borrowers present some very special risk to the bankruptcy system that I am missing? No, I don't believe they do. They're, in fact, they probably present less risk uh, than particularly some of the business filers or, or you know, um, and when it, there was one point in 1978 when the members of this uh, committee had said that it was inappropriate to really view the student loan programs um, as a, a social program when we're granting the loans, but then to treat them as business, strictly as business when you're trying to collect the debt. I would say it's even worse than that because as you have pointed out, we allow the business entrepreneur to, to get a discharge, but we don't allow the student loan borrower. Thank you, Mr. Round. Thank you, Ms. Jimenez, for making the trip back. I had one more question, but I am out of time. And I would just say before I yield back, Mr. Chairman, that yesterday I introduced with uh, Senator Sanders and Representative Omar a bold package to cancel $1.5 trillion in student loan debt and to ensure that we can actually invest in the future of our young people by making college tuition free and debt free. And uh, I look forward to the day when we can make that kind of investment for our future. Thank you. I thank the gentlelady. I now recognize the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Scanlon, for five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, the issue of student loan debt is one that comes up at every town hall and every constituent conversation that I have. Um, Pennsylvania has the highest student debt levels in the country. 1.8 million people have some amount of student loan debt in Pennsylvania, and the average of $36,000 per person is about 20% higher than the rest of the country. So it's a huge issue in my community. Um, what's really been striking to me is the intergenerational impact that we're seeing now. So, uh, you know, whether last August I met a woman who had just dropped her daughter off at college and she was emotional, and it wasn't because her daughter was going to college, it was because her daughter was going to her second choice college. Mom and dad were still paying off their student debt, so the daughter couldn't go to her first choice college. And then uh, there's Nate and Natalie who attend church with me. Uh, young parents, they have boys uh, four and six, and they can't start saving for their kids' education because they're still paying their student loans. I, and these are responsible people. They're paying their taxes, they're paying their loans, they're doing what they're supposed to do. Um, you know, my, my own kids' friends, my, my three have just graduated from college, and I'm hearing how people aren't buying cars, and they're not buying houses, and they're not um, getting married, and they're delaying having children. So um, clearly there's an emotional drag on the system. Um, I just uh, saw an article a couple days ago from Adweek about targeting millennial customers. Um, millennial consumers, the, our corporations are having to adjust their marketing tactics because the metrics that held true for previous generations aren't working because um, the millennials have such a debt load, they don't have the discretionary income. So this whole drag on our economy is, 
you know, really something I'm pleased that we're having this hearing to start chipping away. Obviously, amending the bankruptcy code does not solve the whole problem. We have to go after the predatory private colleges and the predatory loans and revamp the system for how people pay for it. But I do think um, that this bankruptcy piece is so important. Um, and, and the piece that really is striking to me is that student loans were dischargeable, that there was this chipping away at it, and now we're treating student loans differently than credit card debt. Um, it, it's kind of astounding to me. Um, so uh, I guess maybe Ms. Eminence, um, am I correct that the amendment suggested here would not create special rules for student loan debt, like favored treatment for student loan debt, but would lump it in with the general category of debt, is that right? That's right, absolutely correct. Um, the, uh, the student loan debt um, special treatment is the, uh, the rare event. Um, and so the, the um, Representative Nadler's uh, bill and Senator Durbin's bill would just take that, take that special treatment away. Okay, and Mr. Rao, so when we're treating student loans like other debt, that doesn't mean that someone's gonna be able to walk in and say, I just don't feel like paying, kind of like I just don't feel like paying my credit cards, does it? Right. It, again, there's, there's now um, let the bankruptcy code does screen for consumers who would really have a, an ability to repay their debt um, based on their income. So that if they do have that, they would be, the case would be presumed to be abusive and they would not get a discharge. Okay, so we still have the courts and the rest of the bankruptcy code to act as a stopgap against abuses. Yes. Okay. Um, Ms. Jimenez, I think your statement talked a little bit about the the uh, difference in student loan debt and defaults with um, communities of color and that we've got some disparity there. Can you explain that a little? Um, absolutely. The fact that we've chosen to, um, to support the higher education system through loans means that we have created or recreated and exacerbated the wealth gap in this country because we're making people who already come from families who don't have as much wealth as others, we're making them borrow, and, we're, and they already don't have, uh, there's already disparities in education, in um, job prospects based on implicit bias and just outright racism, um, and we're, get, we're making those people take out loans, um, and then there's actually evidence that we're suing them more often, and that um, they're not receiving the same benefits as others in income driven repayments. Okay, and, and the thing that really surprised me when I started looking into this was the statistic that women actually hold more student loan debt. Two-thirds of all student loan debt is women, despite the fact that they have less wealth with which to repay. Can you comment on that? Exactly. Um, yeah, I, a lot of that is actually uh, working women, single parents, uh, who are preyed upon by for-profit colleges. They mostly, they did take, take out private loans, but for-profit colleges' business model is really around federal loans. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're, um, even if we made private student loans non-dischargeable, that wouldn't really solve that problem. Okay, so that's kind of an intersection of the two problems. That's right. Okay, thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Nagus, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you for uh, holding this important hearing. Uh, and appreciate the witnesses and their testimony. Uh, I want to focus in on uh, an issue that uh, many of my colleagues have, have talked about already at great length, which is, of course, uh, the student loan debt that is uh, harming so many people across our country uh, and really drastically impacting the lives of uh, nearly 45 million people. And the crippling effect of student loans on our nation's financial health is, is, of course, well known to this committee and I believe to the witnesses as well. Uh, just to give you some sense of context, I represent uh, the great state of Colorado. In Colorado, student loan debt as of January 2019 is $26 billion and it impacts 700,000 Coloradans uh, and more than 20,000 rural Coloradan residents are severely delinquent. So uh, this is a, uh, an issue that we must address, uh, I think, with the urgency that it requires, which is why I'm proud to be uh, one of the co-lead uh, and lead sponsors of the Student Borrower Bankruptcy Relief Act of 2019 with Chairman Nadler and uh, Senator Durbin to ensure ultimately the bankruptcy code is fair to all. I want to uh, just have a question for you, Mr. Keach. I reviewed your written testimony, and I guess I'm trying to better understand the rationale for the exception as it was enacted 
in the early 1970s, and then obviously over time it was uh, changed, right? So in, in your written testimony, uh, you offer that the Consumer Commission, which is a, a commission of the ABI, uh, weighed the rationale, I'm quoting from your written testimony, uh, for student loan dischargeability against the current and projected student debt landscape. And then I'll just give you a quote. The commission considered but rejected the notion of making student loans freely dischargeable, which I think is a misnomer in terms of the word freely, but I understand that this is from the commission, uh, freely dischargeable like any other debt, concluding that the rationales supporting non-dischargeability remain valid. So I, could you, you know, explain what was going on in the minds of policymakers 40 years ago as to why they did, came up with this exception in the first place? Sure, I, I, I can try. I think, uh, I think my colleagues to the left, all, all three of which are members of the ABI Consumer Commission, and I thank them for their service um, in that respect, uh, could probably speak to this. But I, I think um, the historical antecedents that have been talked about are, I think are largely accurate, and that is that there was... Um, there were beliefs about moral hazard. I think that's been addressed. I think the bigger concern was probably for the solvency of the federal student loan program, or at least for the liquidity and solvency of the program. The, the ABI Consumer Commission recommendation actually is somewhat of a midpoint between those people who are concerned about that and, and complete discharge, uh, and in fact would um, discharge private loans. It would also allow for the discharge of federally uh, provided, guaranteed, or insured loans that were more than seven years old at the time of the bankruptcy, would also allow for discharge of loan obligations of people other than the students themselves, and would also materially reform the so-called Bruner hardship test to make that test meaningful and allow for people to actually get discharged under that test. As Judge Small said, that doesn't happen today. It doesn't um, allow for full dischargeability of federally funded, guaranteed, or insured student debt and so other, on, other than under the hardship test. On that precise point, sure. notwithstanding the undue hardship test and obviously the recognition that that test is, um, you know, has not been, uh, that with the lack of any real discernible standards makes it uh, largely toothless. But I, I guess I am trying to better understand why adhere to this purported rationale that was adopted 50 years ago if the underlying you know, presuppositions of that rationale have not come to pass. Sure, I, I think that, I don't want to speak for the full ABI Consumer Commission, but I think that, I don't think there's any support in that commission or in the commission recommendation for the rationale about moral hazard. I think that's gone out the window. I don't think anybody's making that argument anymore. Um, I think that to the extent that there's balance built into the ABI Consumer Commission um, report, which is probably somewhere near where Ranking Member Sensenbrenner was in, in, the, in the Nadler bill, um, is really about um, a concern for continued solvency and funding of the federal system. And it doesn't at all try to protect the private lending system. But do we, again, so to that yeah. point, do we have, thank you for your answer, do we have any empirical data that suggests that that concern is substantiated? I guess that's my point, because with a wide variety of other, uh, you know, common uh, loan structures, right? I'm thinking sure. of home mortgages by way of example. Uh, you know, we certainly, those are dischargeable in bankruptcy and, and we don't have, you know, uh, wide concerns about the, the security of that program. I guess that's well, what I'm trying to get at. And well, I'm, I mean, in, in, interestingly enough, actually, residential mortgages that are, that are within the federal, you know, various federal programs actually do have more protection under the bankruptcy code than regular private loans. So that, there's actually a pretty direct parallel here. Um, but they're dischargeable. Well, they're not fully dis they're not fully modifiable or fully sure. dischargeable, right? They I mean, are in fact, in, you can't. They are in part dischargeable. It's certainly far more dischargeable than a student loan. Well, you, oh, anyway, I see my time has expired. But to the extent there's a deficiency, that's true. But you can't actually modify materially in Chapter 13, for example, uh, a, a first mortgage uh, because of the federal mortgage insurance program. So, it there are some parallels uh, to that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Georgia, Ms. McBath, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm so glad uh, for uh, each of you spending a few moments with us this morning. I'm very excited to be uh, the co-sponsor of the Bipartisan Haven Act of 2019, along with my uh, Republican colleague, Mr. Stubbe. Um, this measure has also been endorsed not only by uh, Ms. Petraeus and Mr. Koch, but also uh, endorsed by the veterans of Foreign Affairs, American Legion, 
disabled American veterans among others. And uh, I appreciate this opportunity to discuss ways in which we can reform our bankruptcy system to better serve people and small businesses facing, that are facing financial hardship. No one wants to turn to bankruptcy. And we should ensure that these systems effectively help people rescue their financial lives. I'm especially pleased to have the opportunity to discuss my bill, the Haven Act, uh, which I introduced, as I said once before, with my Republican colleague, Congressman Stubbe. This bill would help veterans qualify for bankruptcy relief by excluding their VA and Department of Defense benefits from the calculation of their income as it is already done with Social Security uh, uh, disability payments. This small change will help veterans who are most in need, and no one should ever be penalized for the payments they receive for their injuries resulting from their brave service to our country. I'm proud to support this bipartisan bill and to discuss it with you today. And Mr. Keach, um, I'll turn to you, if you will. Can you think of any, any reason why Social Security benefits should be treated differently than VA or Department of Defense benefits for bankruptcy income calculations? Uh, the ABI can't think of any reason why that should be true. Um, the, we, we fully support the Haven Act. We, we frankly are a, a belief that the inclusion of these b benefits for our veterans in disposable income calculation was an error, and that error should be corrected, and this bill would do that. Thank you very much. And Ms. Petraeus, in your written testimony today, you cite a study indicating that 125,000 veterans filed for bankruptcy in 2017. The study also found that although veterans comprise only 10.3% of the population, they make up 14.7% of Chapter 7 debtors and 15% of Chapter 13 debtors. Why is it important for veterans to be able to access Chapter 7 bankruptcy rather than counting their benefits as income and potentially making only Chapter 13 bankruptcy relief available for themselves? Thank you for the question. I must say this has been an education for me on bankruptcy. Chapter 7 is the equivalent of a fire sale. Everything must go. You dispose of your assets and then you walk away freed of your obligations. Uh, chapter 13 is a whole other thing where you end up paying for three to five years. You have to set up a payment plan. And um, frankly, for many of these veterans, they don't have a whole lot of money to start with. And if they end up having to even take their disability pension and apply it to their payment plan, they've got almost nothing left. Um, the military leads a very mobile lifestyle. Um, I myself moved 24 times in 37 years while my husband was on active duty. Um, the spouse unemployment is a very significant issue for the military, which means um, they have not had a spouse who had, has had the opportunity to build um, a career or to have a very significant income. When you add in disability, that spouse may now be a full-time caregiver as well. So they just don't have a lot of money, um, frankly, and to, again, to take away their pension, and, and apply it to a payment plan is um, just punitive, and I can't imagine that that was really intended. Thank you, and one more question. Based on your many years of experience working with service members and veterans dealing with financial challenges, why do you think so many veterans are seek, seeking bankruptcy relief? Again, I think um, some of it is just um, a product of the life they've led. The military is not a place where you get rich. Um, it's very meaningful service. Um, I was lucky enough to live in that community my whole life. Um, they do it for the best of reasons, I think. But it's, uh, they tend to have lower income as a group. Um, a significant number of them do have issues after serving um, that may impact their ability to get or to keep a job. Um, I'll also say they're not exempt from the student loan crisis. Uh, even though they have the GI Bill, uh, a surprising number of veterans have significant student loans, in many cases because they have been targeted by uh, unscrupulous for-profit colleges that have marketed to them, and uh, they have spent not only their GI Bill, but then taken out private student loans to fund uh, what in many cases is a fairly worthless education. So. Um, they have a lot of the same issues. They have a mobile lifestyle. 
um, and they don't have a good income to start with. So when they get out of the military, um, that may put them in a very shaky financial situation. Thank you so much for your service, and thank you so much for your testimony, and I'm out of time. I thank the gentleman for yielding back. Uh, I now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, thank you again to our witnesses who participated in today's hearing. Uh, Ms. Patrice, thank you for your work and uh, the passion with which you, you bring to this important work. Uh, I think we all recognize the current system that creates or provides uh, or exempts, I should say, Social Security benefits from the law's current definition of current monthly income for purposes of determining eligibility for consumer bankruptcy relief, uh, and while at the same time disability benefits from the Veterans Administration and the Defense Department are not, seems to make very little sense to anyone, and I'm just wondering if any of the witnesses to, uh, on the panel today can think of any good reason for this disparate treatment. Okay, the record should reflect there that no witness saw it, and I, I thank you again for your advocacy for this important bill. Um, I wanna just turn now to the, to the student loan bankruptcy. Uh, I, I misspoke in my opening statement uh, when I indicated that student loan debt is at 1.5 trillion and will be at 2 trillion by 2022. I think I said billion by mistake. And uh, for me, uh, sort of in, in line with what Ms. Jayapal said earlier, uh, when we talk about this gaming the system, I think it's fair to say the system is gaming young people that the system right now forces young people to come, go into tremendous debt with really no ability to get out. And the consequences for that on the individual borrower as well as our economy broadly is, is enormously significant. But I wanna just respond to a question that was raised earlier about how do we make sure young people aren't just gaming the system. Uh, there was, and I think you, Mr. Rayo, made reference to this report. The GAO study found that only a fraction, uh, in fact, it summarized the GAO findings, First, the general default rate on educational loans is approximately 18%. Of that 18%, three to 4% of the amounts involved are discharged in bankruptcy cases. Thus, approximately one half to one quarter of 1%, one half of one quarter of 1% of all matured education loans are discharged in bankruptcy. This compares favorably with the consumer finance industry. So there wasn't a problem that of young people gaming the system, it was one half of, or one quarter of 1%. You have to wonder what, what resulted in the creation of this undue hardship standard. But in addition to there being no evidence that's necessary, Mr. Rare, why has this standard been difficult to administer and why has this undue hardship application kind of varied from case to case? And what does that mean for, our, for kind of the system overall? Yes, Chairman Cicilline, as I mentioned in my statement, it's just not a, a viable way to approach the student loan problem. The cost alone, so there's the issue of the vagueness of the standard and the fact that judges apply it in different ways and the fact that it's been interpreted by the circuit courts to apply a very strict standard. But even putting that aside for the moment, the system requires that there be a, a litigation and we're talking about the, the consumers who would be most eligible for an undue hardship could barely pay for the cost to file the underlying bankruptcy case, let alone tens of thousands of dollars to fund contested litigation. The Department of Education fights these cases very hard, as well as the contractor that's hired by them, uh, ECMC. So it's just, not, it's just not happening. People aren't getting undue hardship discharges. And I think uh, many of my colleagues uh, in this hearing have referenced our additional responsibility to figure out how we make the costs of higher education affordable and accessible. And we're dealing today with some of the symptoms of a system that's broken where people are accumulating enormous debt and not able to pay it. We have to do both. I think we have to address this question, but we also have to deal with kind of the source of the problem uh, in a different committee and with different legislation. Um, but, th but I really wanna thank you because this is a very serious issue I think we hear about it all the time from young people and from families. I hear about it every day from my sister who has two children who just finished school and are saddled with enormous student loan debt. And uh, we hear this uh, wherever we go. So uh, these are important bills that we intend to move. Um, the last issue I wanna just raise is a, a slightly different issue. Uh, and that relates to chapter seven bankruptcies. Uh, trustees act as a fiduciary appointed by the Justice Department to ensure that debtors comply with various requirements, including filing documents with the court and surrendering their non-exempt assets for liquidation, along with other essential responsibilities. 
The fee for trustees is paid by debtors. And in addition to paying for legal representation and compulsory debt counseling, debtors must also pay a $335 fee to file for Chapter 7 bankruptcy. The Chapter 7 trustees receive just $60 of this filing fee, a compensation level that has not been adjusted in 25 years. And the only method of compensation in more than 90% of Chapter 7 cases. So this is a significant problem. It is an understatement that increasing Chapter 7 trustees' compensation is long overdue. I think everyone recognizes that. Mr. Rayo, you've previously testified in favor of addressing this problem through a source of funds outside of steep increases in consumer debt or filing fees. What are some of those sources, and what are some other ways to reduce consumer debtors' burdens in bankruptcy while also addressing this sort of unfairness of this $60 fee, which has been unchanged for 25 years? Yes, Chairman Cicilline, trustees are also compensated um, by um, the assets which are sold in a bankruptcy case. And there's a certain percentages that are in the bankruptcy code as to how much of a percentage of the asset that they are able to receive as a commission. Our proposal would be to adjust those cutoffs so that they would receive higher amounts in those asset cases through the commission on the sale of assets. The other way to approach the problem, the, the, the opposition that we have had to the bills that have been introduced is that they focus solely on having debtors pay for, for the increased compensation through filing fees. The other possibility is to make, make it possible so that there are savings for consumers uh, in, in, in reducing some of the filing requirements so that there's a less burden on them in filing the case and then possibly there may be a, 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 that they could share some of the costs through an increase in filing fee, but only if there's a compensating reduction in their cost of access to the bankruptcy system. Thank you. Uh, with that, I think there are no... Sorry, I just want to make sure I properly close the hearing. First, I want to say thank you uh, to the witnesses for this incredibly useful testimony. It will inform and guide our work. Uh, I ha ask unanimous consent to include a number of letters and statements in the record regarding uh, proposed measures to address issues in our bankruptcy code, two statements from the American College of Bankruptcy, one endorsing the Family Farmer Relief Act and the Small Business Reorganization Act, one supporting the Haven Act, and a statement from the Association of Young Americans endorsing the Student Borrower Bankruptcy Relief Act without objection. This concludes today's hearing. Thank you again to our distinguished witnesses. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written testimony, uh, sorry, additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. And without objection, this hearing is adjourned.